This is question number two from the chapter 10 problem solving session. So in question two, we are working with a series of reactions that are occurring one after the other after the other. You can recognize this because we see in the number sequence here, one, two, three. So we want to know what the final major organic product resulting from this sequence is. So what this question is really asking for is not what do you get after step one? What do you get after step two? What do you get after step three? It's asking just what happens at the very end of this sequence? What is the final product resulting at the end of step three? It's what you really need to provide here. In order for me to get to step three, I really need to go through each of these three steps and think about what product results from each one to be confident that I'm getting to the correct final answer. So what I'm going to do here in sketching out my process, my method to the madness here, is what happens at each step of the reaction. So in step one, how I would describe this reaction is I would describe this as the formation of your organometallic reagent. Specifically, this is the formation of the Grignard reagent. And you can recognize this reaction as one that will yield a Grignard reagent because anytime you have magnesium reacting with an organohalide, that is always going to yield a bond where we'll have a magnesium inserted here between the carbon and the halogen atom. And that's going to be our so-called organometallic compound. So our result of step one here, I'm not going to go through the mechanism for it, but we'll have our aromatic ring directly bonded to the magnesium and then our bromine atom. And just as an aside here, it doesn't matter what type of carbon atom you have here, bonded to the halogen, whether it's an sp, sp2, as we have in this case, or an sp3 carbon, they're all suitable for this reaction to take place. So it's a very flexible reaction in that regard. So the Grignard reagent forms, and we can think of this Grignard reagent as having a carbon-magnesium bond here that is very, very polarized, with the magnesium being more electronegative than carbon, less electronegative than carbon, rather. And so the magnesium is going to be positively polarized very strongly. The carbon is going to be very strongly negatively polarized. And as a result, for purposes of thinking about how the reaction is going to take place, you can really think of that carbon atom as having possession of both of the electrons from this covalent bond. And since it has both of the electrons from the covalent bond there, that is going to result in that carbon behaving as if it has a negative formal charge and being very, very basic, meaning that it would be very happy to grab a proton from something like water, if any water were present. Also, it's very happy to act as a nucleophile, meaning it will attack a carbon atom. So this Grignard reagent is going to sit around in solution until you bring in here at step two, our ketone molecule, 2-butanone, and what will happen is that the Grignard reagent, having that carbon that is acting as a carb anion because it's so negatively polarized, comes in, attacks the very electrophilic carbon atom here. That carbon is very electrophilic because it's bonded to the oxygen atom, and we could by resonance show that that pi bond could have moved up onto the oxygen by resonance, making this carbon positively charged in one of the resonance structures. So it's a very electrophilic, very positively polarized carbon atom. So therefore, the nucleophilic electrons are very eager to form a bond there. In order for that bond to form, something's got to give because we can't ever go over the octet rule, and so therefore, the pi electrons are free to move up onto the oxygen atom. And that's going to give us our product that results from step two of the mechanism, mini mechanism that we've just drawn out here. So we would end up with this oxygen anion. And I'm gonna show my new covalent bond here in green. We would have a new covalent bond leading to our aromatic ring. And one way to abbreviate an aromatic ring, a six membered ring that has those alternating single and double bonds is the term pH. pH refers to a phenyl group, P-H-E-N-Y-L, which is our abbreviation for an aromatic ring directly bonded to the rest of the molecule. So this is a succinct way to abbreviate this. And then in step three, we add dilute acid. 
and the purpose of the acid here. Acid is a proton donor, so I'm just going to simply plug that in as H+. And protons are a match made in heaven for bases, so the base comes in, grabs that proton from whatever acid you're using there. Sulfuric acid is a very typical one for this application. And then we'll go ahead and plug in our full hydroxy group there. We'll still have our phenyl group down here. So the outcome of this reaction, your final major organic product is going to be the product that we see right here. And the cool things about this reaction are it's a way to create an alcohol functional group in a molecule, which alcohols are the main focus of chapter 10 here. The other thing that is super cool and makes this reaction extremely valuable is the fact that it creates at this step, a new bond between two carbon atoms. And creating a new carbon-carbon bond is something that's extremely valuable in creating molecules that have practical applications, but it's also a reaction that can be tricky to accomplish. And so the use of a Grignard reagent is going to be a really valuable way to form new carbon-carbon bonds like what we're seeing here to give us our final product. So we will do a similar theme for part B here, where we're starting with an alkyl halide. We're reacting with magnesium, and THF is tetrahydrofuran. It is an ether solvent, so just like we're using an ether up here as our solvent, it's not directly participating in the reaction. You could think of it as just the soup that the magnesium and the alkyl halide are present in and reacting with them. So in step one, what we need to focus on is that we have that magnesium and alkyl halide, any organohalide plus magnesium is going to give us our Grignard formation, which in this case, just plug that magnesium in between our chlorine and our carbon. Make sure that you haven't created or destroyed any carbon atoms here. We start with three carbon atoms. We finish with three carbon atoms as well. Then we go onward to step two of the reaction series. And in step two, we bring in our epoxide, that three-membered ring with an oxygen atom. And much like before, the Grignard reagent that we saw up here behaves with that bond very, very heavily polarized so that the carbon atom acts as a carb anion. The same thing is going to be true down at the bottom. So we can really think of this as behaving as if that carbon is a carb anion. It's very strongly basic and very strongly nucleophilic. So it's going to use that lone pair of electrons we could think of it as having to come over here and attack one of the two carbon atoms of the epoxide here or here because the two carbon atoms here and here are the most electrophilic. They're the most electron deficient of all the carbons in this molecule because they're each bonded to that electronegative oxygen that's pulling electron density away from them. The one that is going to be targeted preferentially here in this regioselective reaction is going to be the less sterically hindered one. So the less sterically hindered one is the one here on the left because it does not have those relatively bulky methyl groups hanging off of it. So therefore, the carbon atom, carbanion, can get easier access to this position than to the other position. It's going to preferentially attack here. That is going to force the carbon-oxygen bond to break. That's the weakest bond here. And so we could think of that oxygen as being like the leaving group. It's what's breaking away there. And we will go ahead and trace out the product that results from this reaction. So we have our three-carbon chain that we started with over here. I'm going to show my newly formed carbon-carbon bond in red. So our newly formed carbon-carbon bond in red right there to match the electron pushing arrow that I've shown here. And then I'm going to go back to black for the part of the molecule that originated from the epoxide. So our epoxide had a carbon atom right here that was directly bonded to the other carbon in the epoxide and the two methyl groups there and our oxygen, which will become an oxygen anion. So what we did here was we broke that carbon-oxygen bond, and therefore we have an oxygen at a carbon atom right here that corresponds to the carbon that became bonded to the three-carbon chain from our Grignard reagent. So that's going to be this carbon right here was the carbon of the epoxide that's right here. And then our next carbon of the chain is over here. That's going to correspond to right here. It has two methyl groups, one, two. 
Same thing here. It's got a methyl group here and a methyl group here. And then we have a bond here still. We didn't do anything to this bond. I'm highlighting a red of the epoxide. So that bond is still there. And that's going to be your oxygen anion. Because our oxygen started off its life with two sets of lone pair electrons. And then it picked up a third set of lone pair electrons when this bond broke. So that gives us our oxygen anion that we see over here. Then finally, to get us to the final major product of this reaction, the third reagent that was added to our mixture was dilute acid. So just like up top here, we have a match made in heaven with an oxygen anion that's quite basic because it has that negative formal charge and lone pair of electrons. Comes over, grabs that proton from whatever acid you're using, and that leads us to our major final organic product, which I'll go ahead and show right here. And I'm going to go ahead and box that in for you as well. So that would be the correct final answer to this problem. So when it says draw the final major organic products, all you really need to show to get the problem right is what I've shown in the blue highlighted boxes here. I sketched out my work to make sure that I was confident I was getting to the right final product. One thing that I recommend doing when you get to the end of the road with these to make sure that you haven't made a silly mistake along the way is double check that you haven't created or destroyed any carbon atoms along the way. So we start off in these reactions with one, two, three carbons from our alkyl halide. We ultimately reacted with a structure that had one, two, three, four carbons in total. And so three carbons plus four carbons makes seven. So we should have a product that has seven carbons in total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that at least gives us some idea that we are on the right track because with these carbon-carbon bond forming reactions, it's awfully easy to accidentally insert or delete a carbon atom along the way. And then it's very hard um, from the perspective of myself, the person grading these problems, to see whether you really knew what you were doing and just uh, accidentally lost a carbon along the way or whether you really were on shaky terms and didn't really know what you were doing, kind of guessed your way through. So make sure that you're conserving your carbons along the way here.